Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Today, more cabinet picks loom for the Biden administration. The Felix Sater money laundering case is moving forward. Rudy Giuliani holds a quote-unquote hearing in Arizona as they certify their results today for Biden. Trump claims the FBI and the Department of Justice rigged the election against him. And the second half of my interview with my former boss, the former Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, David Shulkin. I'm your host, A.G. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Oh, I'm sleepy. I, I'm feeling sleepy. <laughs> I just I was freaked out when you said December 1st. I'm like, it is March 189th. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> December. How did that happen? March. I feel like we've just gotten out of that phase where like everyone doesn't know what day of the month it is. And we're about to go back into it because like that week between Christmas and New Year's, everyone's like, fuck all. I have no idea what day it is. I don't know what month it is. I don't mm. I don't know the date. Mm. Yeah, we're just going to go right back into it. Yeah, we've been in one of those aliens hypersleep pods or something. I don't I don't know, but we've had to be awake. We've had to experience all the bad stuff. It's it makes no sense. Oh my god. Can you oh, AG, can you imagine all these people that have been like in a coma for the last 3 years or 4 years, let's say. And they wake up and they don't know any of this has happened, but all all the people around them are just completely horrified, like completely fucked up from the last four years. And everyone waking up is like, I feel amazing. Yeah, like we're away from your coma. What do you want to do? Disneyland? Yeah. Nope. 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 Can't go there. Why do you have a mask on your face? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Why does everybody man. look so downtrodden and sad? Don't I mean, even two it. years, people wouldn't know what the hell's going on. Oh, my God. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. Yeah. I'd be like, I don't want to know. Just don't just don't even tell me. Um, no. Uh, well, Biden's going to be inaugurated. Cool. Let's just go with that. Uh, can I go back to sleep until then? Yep. That's all. I'm, that's all I'm looking forward to. That'd be great. We have a big show today. A year ago, I interviewed the former secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, David Shulkin, about his book that came out then. His book is called It Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Country. And that resonated with me. The interview was in two parts, though. The first part was about his book, and uh, we released that. And the second part was a, a little more personal about me and my removal from government and, and all that other stuff. And, and of course, the uh, scathing Inspector General report outlining Trump's dismantling of the VA Accountability and Whistleblower Protection Office that Shulkin himself had created. And we learned a lot um, since then. We learned that not only were whistleblowers being ignored, but... They were being retaliated against if Trump didn't like their politics. Uh, and the second half of the interview, again, was, again, re regarding my removal. Um, and I couldn't ethically release it until now because I, I couldn't tell my story until I no longer worked for the VA. Um, I had already been fired at that point. I was just waiting on the paperwork to go through. Government takes forever on everything. And I also had to wait until the Mueller She Wrote podcast ended, um, which is why I was removed from government service uh, in my in my view and the view of many others. But, uh, you know, it, it would not be ethically appropriate for me to tell my story, because if you profit at all personally in any way uh, from your government service, that, that runs afoul of ethics rules. So I had waited till everything was done and over, and now it is. So I'll be talking about that, releasing the second half of the interview later in the show. I'll also be chatting with the co-host of the National Security Law Podcast, a professor at the University of Texas School of Law. His name is Steve Vladek. He's been on here before. He's a self-proclaimed SCOTUS nerd. And we're going to talk about these state legislative hearings, quote unquote, in Pennsylvania and Arizona, led by Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis. They're pretty hilarious. And then, of course, we have the good news. But first, we do have some headlines for you. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. Lead story today. Arizona and Wisconsin have both certified their election results. Just a few moments ago, I think Wisco the governor of Wisconsin signed off on it as well. Um, <laughs> Joe's won the state, what, 15, 16 times now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now all of the battleground states have certified uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the winners of the election. And as Trump and his team of idiot lawyers drone on about fraud to the public while telling the courts there is no fraud, by the way, um, Biden continues to 
vet cabinet picks. First of all, um, yesterday there were a couple of uh, late additions to the all-women communications team. Simone Sanders and Ashley Etienne are the two top press aides to Kamala Harris. Biden is now looking at Alyssa Slotkin, Sue Gordon, and Jay Johnson for CIA director. The top three candidates for Secretary of Defense now are Michelle Flournoy, Jay Johnson, and retired Army General Lloyd Austin. Any of those uh, for Secretary of Defense, by the way, would be a first because Austin and Johnson would be the first black Secretary of Defense and Flournoy would be the first woman. So it's going to be a first uh, re- regardless of who the of those three he chooses. <laughs> and I think it's funny that Schmuck Ben Shapiro is like, uh, this is not a very diverse uh, cabinet so far. Uh, there's no men. I'm like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I know men have really been discriminated against up until this point, but I promise you'll get your day one day. One day men will be back in power. <laughs> and also, Joe fucking Biden. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, last time I checked, I think he identifies as uh, he, him, man, uh, yeah. white, old, in the, okay. He's the one doing the hiring. Anyhow, um, it's, this is uh, really great news. I, you know, I think I, I love all this. Really oddly, though, uh, Republican senators are now saying, well, we're going to need to see their tax returns. I don't know that I, I want to know about all their foreign entanglements before we like, oh, shut up. Oh, God, it's going to make me furious. We all just need to take a deep breath when this happens because, you mm-hmm. know, it's coming back around. It's going to be hypocrisy. It is, it is deep as levels. It's yep. going to be. So just take a breath. <laughs> It is. It's going to be really bad. But I was like, are oh, you got to be fucking kidding me? Okay. All right. Corning. I love this next headline because we could basically put it in the good news, uh, good, good news segment too, because this is, this is, this is good. A federal judge on Monday partially advanced a lawsuit accusing Russian mafia tied businessman Felix Sater of laundering millions stolen from Kazakhstan's BTA bank through Trump organization properties. What? Okay. Uh, Big smile. In the case, this is a quote, in the case Kazakhstan's largest city and a Kazakhstani bank seek to recover millions of dollars in stolen funds from those who allegedly helped the culprits launder them. This sounds like a, like a, like a, like a movie, like a movie script. Mm. I almost want to read it that way. This was, uh, that quote was from the U.S. District Judge Allison Nathan. Some, she summarized in a 25-page opinion, dismissing only two counts of the five-count complaint. Do so, it do it like a do it like a movie trailer in a world Felix Sater the alleged ringleader of the uh, money do it yeah in <laughs> Felix Sater, the alleged green leader of the money laundering operation, along with his associate Daniel Ridloff and several business entities they control, move to dismiss. <laughs> dun dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> like Sater, Ridloff was also formally associated with who? The Trump Organization. The lawsuit stems from allegations of the sy- sy- systematic looting, goodness, systematic losing, looting of Kazakhstan's largest city, Almal, um, geez, they, well, I don't know what's going on with my tongue today. You'd think for a lesbian, I'd have more control over it. Al- Almady? Almady. <laughs> Almady? Say it, AG. How do you pronounce that <laughs> Kazakhstani city? Almady? Oh, Maddie. Oh, you don't know either. Okay, good. No, I don't know. Can I someone know. please send in a correction? Um, okay, I'm going to start that sentence over there without going and edit. I've only seen Borat one time. Yeah. Okay. The lawsuit stems from allegations of the systemic looting of Kazakhstan's largest city, Almaty. That's what we're going with. And its bank in 2009. So this is a few years old. About 11 now. The court emphasizes that the Kazakh entities, which need to adduce evidence showing that um, the Seder defendants' deceptive conduct and their justifiable reliance on that conduct is significantly greater detail to meet their burdens of pro- production and of proof as the case progresses. So bottom line is they need more shit. They need more evidence. Mm. They need to back this up. So that was what Nathan wrote um, when she when she gave um, when she gave this. How, and then she goes on to say, however, at this stage, the court concludes that it is not clear on the face of the complaint that their claims are untimely and so declines to dismiss any claims on that basis. So mm. this is moving forward. And this is a good thing, obviously, for a few reasons. <laughs> I like I know how you like to say, though, I would be real. I, I hope that Felix is in some sort of s- custody, like safe custody. So he doesn't have a heart attack out, out of a fifth story window. Um, since he seems to be a Russian mafia-tied businessman. Uh, but this is, you know, it all goes back to Trump. Follow the money. 
Follow mm. the money. Yeah, and I believe Felix Sater, uh, and you know, I'll go over this in more detail later in the week, but I, I believe he's the one who got arrested at some point in the 90s for stabbing some guy in the eye with the broken stem of a champagne glass or something oh, like that. Oh Martini, margarita glass. I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll look back into that. But it, this guy, <laughs> this is... This is some dude. He's all over the Mueller report. Um, he he was trying to sell properties in Trump Tower Moscow. He was part of that deal, trying to set up the Trump Tower Moscow that Trump, you know, when Trump lied and said he had no business deals in Russia, and they were actually trying to set one up with with Cohen and yeah. um, that you know he was part of that. Like we all remember Felix Sater. Um, he was on our fantasy indictment draft, and like I said, I'll be talking about this case in more detail later in the week as I pour over the filings. Um, and, uh, you know, as it as it continues to unfold. Uh, also in the news today, uh, Trump has now accused the FBI and the Department of Justice of rigging the election <laughs> against him. Yeah, you know, Bill Barr, king of the deep state. Um, <laughs> like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Now, oh, he man. still hasn't fired Chris Ray of the FBI or Gina Haspel of the CIA. Remember, they were on, they were on, you know... Uh, on watch like on i'm gonna about to be fired watch when when he removed everybody from the pentagon and and did that whole you know thing and replaced the general counsel at the nsa with mike ellis who's the guy who tried to hide the Zelensky conversation from everybody it's just a really uh, weird thing going on um with trump and the fbi and the cia and we'll see what happens uh in the next week or two if he's going to end up firing Uh, the two of them. But the FBI, you know, you and I reported earlier um, a couple weeks ago that the FBI, uh, the group of agents, I can't remember what they're called, Agents Association, Mm -hmm. uh, had written a letter to both Biden and Trump saying, please don't fire him. We need continuity. He's a good dude. And so, you know, but Trump will do what Trump will do. And this just in, we now, right as of like a few minutes ago, we have the language of Trump's pardon, the legal language of Trump's pardon of Michael Flynn. Sidney Powell has filed a motion uh, in that, that case, the one that's before Judge Sullivan, to dismiss the case against him, the, the, the case of, of lying that he pleaded guilty to twice. Uh, so they, she's filed a motion to dismiss the case, uh, saying it's moot because of the pardon. Let me read you the text of this pardon. It's wackadoo. I it's I've never seen. I thought it was going to be you know because uh, Andrew Torres and I were talking yesterday. It's just going to be a blanket pardon, right? Just before any and all things that he's done, mm-hmm. all the, the shit bag shit he's done from birth until now, um, which is kind of how uh, Ford's pardon of, of Nixon read. But this one gets oddly specific, but then it's very broad. It's just, but of course now we have to remember who authored it. This is Sidney Powell. Uh, who filed the motion. I don't know if she wrote um, the pardon, though. It says to all... And he just makes himself sound so important. Executive Grant of Clemency, Donald Trump, President of the United States of America, to all whom these uh, presents shall come. To all whom these presents shall come. Greeting. (laughs) What? (laughs) To, To all... I'm reading it. To all to whom these presents shall come. Greeting. Be it known that this day I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States, pursuant to my powers under Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1 of the Constitution, have granted unto Michael T. Flynn a full and unconditional pardon for the charge of making false statements to federal investigators in violation of Section 1001, Title 18, U.S. Code, as charged in the information filed under docket number, and then they give the docket number for that case, in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. For any and all possible offenses arising from the facts set forth in the information and statement of offense filed under that docket number or that might arise or be charged, claimed or asserted in connection with the proceedings under that docket number for any and all possible offenses within the investigatory authority or jurisdiction of the special counsel appointed May 17, 2017, including the initial appointment order and subsequent memoranda regarding the special counsel's investigatory authority and for any and all possible offenses arising out of facts and circumstances known to, identified by, or in any manner related to the investigation of the special counsel, including, but not limited to, any grand jury proceeding in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia or the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. So it's very specific but then it says but not limited to right um so that 
includes, that's going to include any other crimes he committed that were investigated by Mueller. It's going to include any other crimes investigated by the FBI before Mueller took over. It's going to include the FARA violations, any, any federal kidnapping charges with the Gulen thing. It doesn't, it does not pardon his kid. So I think his kid is still subject to federal charges. Interesting. Yeah, and of course... Now I, oh, AG, I have a question, and I don't mean yeah. to you know make this part longer, but and this is just me, as you're talking, wondering. So this is basically giving Flynn immunity um, in, in so many different ways. So if they were to go after his kid and Trump doesn't pardon his kid, what's saying that Flynn's not going to turn on Trump at this point, knowing that he already has this pardon and he can't go to prison... And throw his ass under the bus to protect his son. Yeah, I I don't know. And also, as we know, because he no longer has, or you know, because now he has total immunity for all of his crimes, mm-hmm. he he can he can't plead the fifth. Now, right. like we discussed with Torres, he couldn't plead the fifth before on any of the crimes he was forgiven for committing in his plea agreement. Because a plea agreement is much like a pardon in that the crimes you're forgiven for, you can't plead the fifth against because there's no backstop there. You wouldn't be incriminating yourself by by saying anything. So, you know, of course, when Congress says, we'll bring him in and question him, do it after January 20th. And now you can ask him questions specifically about the crimes that involved Donald Trump. But again, Trump is probably going to pardon himself or get a pardon from Pence, which it wouldn't make a difference then anyway, but at least we would know the crimes. At least we would know the truth. Especially if this moron really thinks he's going to do a 2024 run. I mean, I'm not, you know, what that's neither here nor there, but at least we would know. And like you said, he would have these crimes against him, even if he wasn't mm-hmm. punished for them federally. Mm-hmm. Or charged with them yeah. technically. Yeah. Um, all right. Weird pardon. I'm sure they're going to get more weird uh, as they go as they move on. And now that he's starting to attack the DOJ, we'll see what happens there, because I'm sure Barr needs a pardon. Uh, That's fine. Let him go after each other. We've got bigger fish to fry, and that happens to do with coronavirus updates. There's a lot in this section. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration says it has scheduled a meeting of its Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee for December 17th to discuss the request for emergency use authorization for COVID-19 vaccine from biotech company Moderna. So this is the second one, a uh, second company that's now asked for emergency authorization. California The state expects to receive about 327,000 doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine by mid-December and a second dose within three weeks, according to Gavin Newsom. Uh, He declined at that point, though, to give an exact date those doses are to be expected. Now, recommendations on how to distribute the first doses of the vaccine will be made this week as guidelines on how exactly to prioritize distribution are being drafted. Now, the state's task force is also working on the challenge of keeping the vaccines at an ultra low temperature, which has been a problem uh, Mm -hmm. to this point, but they're working on it. Decision makers are looking at the plan with a specific eye on equity. Now, I just have to make a little sidebar that's not in this. If we're looking at equity, this is when Black Lives Matter really needs to come into account um, and not just, uh, you know, socioeconomic stuff, Uh, you know, this or, you know, frontline workers. Frontline workers need to be taken care of first, the medical field and all of that. But um, Ayanna Presley was saying that if you really want to say Black Lives Matter, you've got to look at the underlying conditions within the community that have been created because of the systematic racism in this country. So I want people to just take a little note of that as they figure out the equity of this vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. Um, As we move to Georgia, Governor Brian Kemp extended the state's health emergency and COVID-19 restrictions for another 15 days, according to a release from his office. The order is going to take place December 1st. Now, part of the executive orders signed today include changes that allow nurses and pharmacists to administer the pending COVID-19 vaccine, including in a drive through setting and permits any nurse or pharmacist to observe patients for the requisite 15-minute window after receiving the vaccine. 
The latest extension is going to run through December 15th, um, which is what the release said from Kemp's office. Now, if we move on, we've got Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has urged Congress to pass another round of coronavirus relief before the end of the year and accused, of course, his Democratic colleagues of stonewalling and playing a losing game of politics with desperately needed aid, which is such bullshit because we know he's the one who's been stonewalling this all along. The Democrats in the House have passed several of these uh, relief bills, and none of them have gone through uh, with Mitch McConnell. In, in fact, in his first floor speech after Thanksgiving recess, the Kentucky Republican said that while passing the legislation to fund the government beyond the December 11th deadline, author- authorizing defense spending and confirming federal judges remain priorities for the Republican-led chamber. There's no reason then why we should not deliver another major pandemic relief package to help the American people through what seems poised to be the last chapters of this battle. That to me is such a bullshit phrase because they've been saying this since March. It's going to be gone by April. It's going to be gone by Memorial Day. It's going to be gone by Labor Day. So for Mitch McConnell to come out when he's been shoving unqualified judges through the vote, but will not get these relief packages through, it's one more reason Georgia Georgia voters need to get out there and make sure that we get these two seats because I want his power taken away. Mm. 100% agree with you like I needed to tell you that. (laughs) I like to hear it, though. I like to hear it when people agree with me. (laughs) Like, what podcast am I on again? Mm. Um, Yeah, so that it's absolutely hypocritical. Like like you said, they've passed these bills. Uh, In fact, we didn't want the first shit stuff to expire. And the sorry, the shit in the first bill to expire and the Republicans made it expire. And now they're like, oh, you won't come to the table again. Like we didn't want it to end in the first place. You fucker. Yeah. You went on vacation, Mitch. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, you Mm. actually left and went on vacation with the Senate. You adjourned the Senate when it was expired. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Again, again, we got to get Georgia. We got to take power away from this guy. Um, We'll be right back, though. We're going to talk to Steve Vladek. We're going to discuss Rudy Giuliani's fake state legislature hearings in Pennsylvania and Arizona. And we're going to do that right after this break. So stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's AG. And today's episode of The Daily Beans is brought to you by BetterHelp. And they provide the best in professional counseling when you need it the most. Life is so full of ups and downs right now. There's a lot of anxiety, expected turns, and unforeseen difficulties. And an important thing to remember here is you don't have to face these things and these challenges alone. So if you're struggling with anything that's preventing you from living your happiest life, I recommend BetterHelp. It's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It's actual professional licensed counseling done securely online. They'll assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in less than 24 hours. You know, I've had my own struggles with PTSD and anxiety, and I know how important it is to get help rather than to try to do it yourself. And BetterHelp services are available for clients worldwide. They have a broad range of experts in their counselor network, a lot of which might not be locally available in your area. And the thing about BetterHelp is you can log in from your account from anywhere, anytime, and send a message to your counselor. And you'll get timely, thoughtful responses, and you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great matches with your therapist, so they make it easy and free to change your counselor if you want to. And it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling because financial aid is also available. Visit their website and read testimonials like this BetterHelp user HA who says, Beverly is patient and great at giving me tools to become more in control of the anxiety I've been experiencing. I'd recommend her to anyone coming for counseling for the first time like I did. So visit betterhelp.com slash dailybeans. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, and join the over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for Daily Beans listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash dailybeans. All right, everybody, welcome back. As you might have heard, Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis, the two leaders of the embattled uh, elite strike force legal team trying to overturn the very clear election results, have been hosting what they're calling state legislative hearings, I put in very dark quotes, uh, as protected by the Constitution, they claim. And joining us today to discuss these quote unquote hearings is Professor of Law, University of Texas School of Law and co-host of the National Security Law podcast, Steve Vladek. Steve, welcome back. How are you? Um, I'm okay, but we really need to stop meeting like this. I know. I know. Actually, I enjoy these meetings. I, I, I like to I like to learn 
the kinds of BS that's coming out of, uh, <laughs> of Elite Strike Force Five or whatever. I mean, I feel like you could teach you could you could teach like a whole law school class on 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 just how not to lawyer colon the Elite Strike Force version. Yes, Exhibit One, uh, <laughs> um, Sydney Powell's filing in the third <laughs> third district, the Third Circuit Court. Um, yeah, we were actually kind of wondering today where the language of the pardon is and why it hasn't been submitted in the Flynn case, uh, like a motion to dismiss. And and I maybe like maybe she's running maybe she's running it through Grammarly. We don't know. I mean, there there are krakens that have to be released. Mm, oh, I'm yeah. I'm sorry. You're right. Sorry. The kraken schedule is very you know demanding. So never 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 mind what actually ultimately happens to the kraken. <laughs> you're right. I know. They never think that through. Uh, You know, they're like, we're coming in like the Titanic. All right, cool. Uh, So Rudy and Jenna are asserting that these legislative hearings that they are having are, you know, in three-star hotel lobbies are somehow official hearings protected by constitutional law. Can you explain what part of the Constitution they're applying here and why what they're doing is not that thing? So, I mean, I, I want to sort of joke that it's Article 12, right? Because that's that was Trump's famous, you know, misquote about how it's, you know, his powers in Article 12 of the Constitution. Which <laughs> oh, only that's right. Articles. Um, OK, so so in, a, in on Earth 2, where we are not beholden to these crazy conspiracy theorists, um, the U.S. Constitution does, in fact, contemplate a role for the legislature of a state um, when it comes to the appointment of electors. And it's Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the Constitution, which says, quote, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors, dot, dot, dot. Um, and the sort of the, you know, the elite strike force is ping, pinning all of their, um, well, I don't know what all of zero is still zero, but they're pinning what's left of their credibility to the idea that um, this contemplates that it's ultimately up to the legislature of the state to decide how to uh, appoint their electors, even if the voters, even if the legislature had previously said, we'll leave that up to the voters and the voters chose Biden. But we could disagree with them. Um the problem, well, so one of the 47 problems they've run into is that none of the state legislatures in the relevant states want to have anything to do with this uh, uh, crazy pants theory. Um, and so the best they've been able to do is find a distinct minority of especially conspiracy theory friendly legislators in these states to have sham hearings um, that are not, in fact, of, quote, the legislature, unquote, in your favorite local hotel conference room, um, where not only is there no formal process, but where the, quote, witnesses, unquote, are not actually under oath and would suffer no penalty under the law if, you know, they lied through their teeth. Mm. So in order for these to be considered actual legislative hearings, they need to what, take place in the legislative body with a quorum? No, I mean, that there's, I mean, there's no requirement that you be physically in the state legislature, but at least you have to be acting under the authority of the state legislature. Um, and last I checked, neither the Pennsylvania state legislature nor the Arizona state legislature gave power to any random subset of crazy members of the body to go have a meeting in a bathroom and call it a hearing. I mean, if, you know, if Bobby Chesney and I go out to dinner, that's not a faculty meeting. Um, right. And so, you know, when when folks say, look at this public hearing by the Arizona state legislature, I want to say it's like the old Saturday Night Live joke about the Holy Roman Empire. It's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Discuss. Um, <laughs> these aren't hearings in the sense that they are not legal proceedings subject to any kind of penalty of perjury or contempt or anything like that. And the body before which they're happening is not the Arizona State Legislature. So, you know, we just sort of keep the the, the sort of, as, as Bobby and I call it, the coup de blah um, keeps getting more blah because we're just getting ever further into the weeds of just utter preposterousness. Yeah, and we'll couple these with their multiple lawsuits to block certification in these states. Which are going great. Oh, yeah, one in 39, I think. Well, and, and none of them had actually succeeded in blocking certification. Right. I think what, what their one successful lawsuit had to do with the, uh, uh, what, ballots. Four, four feet closer. You could be four feet closer to observing the polls. I was right, because it was 10 feet and they moved it to six feet. That's the yeah. one. That's the one. Now, these these hearings have occurred in Pennsylvania and Arizona. What, what kind of, just out of curiosity, for the, you know, the, the procedural question here, if the Arizona state legislature did, legislature did want to have something like this. Would they have to file with the court or just make a 
declarative memorandum or how how would they grant it to become what Rudy and Jenna wish it were? So what you would need is you would just need a, the 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 every state has every state legislature has its own lawmaking process. You know how a bill becomes a law, right? The Animaniacs, um, and you know there's a process by which you could theoretically get a state legislature to enact a resolution purporting to appoint electors. Um, right. And in Pennsylvania and Arizona, you could, you know, theoretically have the state legislature try to pass a resolution purporting to appoint the Trump slate of electors. And then you'd have conflicting slates of electors right from these two states. And so it would be up to Congress to decide what to do with that mess um, that I think, it, you know, so. In a, in a world in which there was anyone rational on the other side of this equation, you know, that would be the goal. The goal would be to actually have formal binding resolutions that go through the formal legislative process in Arizona and Pennsylvania, wherein the legislatures at least attempt to appoint a competing slate of electors. Um, because that's too crazy, even for the Republican legislatures in Pennsylvania and Arizona, we instead get this you know, um, skim milk version where you've got like a very small number of members of the legislature who have no power to do that by themselves holding these hearings so that, you know, the, the constituency of one president Trump can say, look, the state legislatures are doing these things when in fact the state legislatures are doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And then if, if they did have go through that formal process, then like you said, the people, who spoke in those hearings would be subject to perjury if they lied their faces off. Uh, there is that is that is one of the problems here, um, right? And so you know it, it is in some respects it is it is it is the exact same thing that's happening in the lawsuits now in the legislative process. The reason why what you're hearing from Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis on television is so different from what they're saying in court is because they can say whatever the heck they want on television. But once they actually sign their names to court filings, they face professional sanctions if they actually lie about fraud. Um, and it's the same thing with these hearings. If these hearings were actually formal hearings before the actual state legislature, then the kind of testimony that they're giving would be sanctionable, um, would be legally sanctionable as opposed to just morally sanctionable. Um, and so all of this is just a ruse. It's a, it's a Travis Schumachery, to quote that, that old terrible beer commercial. Um, <laughs> That's not actually designed to have any legal force. It's just designed to further inflame the, you know, this this conspiracy theory that Biden somehow stole the election, that Trump's the rightful winner, if for no other reason than so that the president can keep fundraising off of it. Um, and meanwhile, you know, we're doing potentially irreparable damage to public confidence in, you know, the integrity of our electoral process. So, you know. It's a wash. Which could turn out really bad for Republicans in Georgia, actually. Well, that, um, I mean, that, of course, that's the question, right? I mean, the question is, you know, is if, if you're spending this whole time period telling folks that the elections don't actually matter and that the Democrats are stealing the elections, how are you then going to convince Georgia voters to show up at the polls on January 5th? But, you know, maybe there's some four dimensional chess that I'm just not not seeing here. I think it's an personally and this is total conjecture. I think it's an ego thing. I think Trump knows that if he lost alone and, you know, the the House the Dems lost some seats in the House and they didn't flip the Senate, that is really bad for him. That means it's just him. But if the Senate gets flipped, he's not alone anymore at being a loser. Um, now, because we, you know, we saw Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, dismiss this case. We saw the Third Circuit dismiss the case, both because, like you said, Rudy had said in court that this is not a fraud case. Uh, so those are very different uh, assertions being made to the public and being made in the courts, because, like you said, you're legally bound. And if these were actual legislative hearings, they would be legally bound by what they said. And even if they wanted to try to get together in some sort of a, a way to appoint a new slate of electors, they couldn't do it ex post facto. I don't even know if that applies here, but they can't do it for it. This past election, it would have to be for future elections. Change the rules. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the idea. And and, you know, I think um, there are a lot of conversations that we can and should be having about what we've learned from the last couple months and how that should affect how we change the rules going forward. But I think there's a lot to be said for the notion that, you know, once millions and millions of Americans have voted under a set of rules that were agreed to in advance, it would be incredibly unfair to say, oh, never mind, you didn't actually vote legally. Um, you know, I that ought to be a principle we can get behind. Um, but, uh, you know, these days, I'm not sure we can all agree that, you know, today's a day that ends in Y. So 
it's the times we live in, I'm afraid, but it's, you know, there, there ought to be some consensus for common sense reforms, at least once, you know, the new administration's in place. I just, I wouldn't hold my breath. Yeah. I wish they went after the Russians in 2016, the way they're going after American voters in 2020. That would be nice. Yep. Um, well, thank you very much. Everybody check out National Security Law Podcast. Uh, you, what, so are you, you're a professor at law at University of Texas, right? You're the co-host of National Security Law Podcast. Where can people follow you on Twitter? Uh, Steve underscore Vladek, although you may regret that. (laughs) No, you won't. I guarantee it. Thanks so much, Steve Vladek. I appreciate your time today. Anytime. Hey, everybody. It's AG for the Daily Beans. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by Echelon. They provide connected fitness at an affordable price, and that's the key, the affordable price part. Uh, Endlessly quarantining at home. I feel I'm not as active as I'd like to be. I crave like that workout, that really tough workout. There's nothing like finishing a, a workout. I absolutely love it. And Echelon prides itself on being able to help you achieve your fitness goals. You can beat your personal records, finish that workout. It's incredible. And their service is amazing because one Echelon membership lets up to five household members enjoy the benefits. They have a huge variety of equipment and programs. Um, Echelon has connected bikes, for example. They give you an immersive spin studio experience. They have smart rowers that take you down the best waterways in the world. And they have those reflect smart mirrors. It's personal training at the touch of a button. And there's just one app to connect them all. Echelon United provides access to all content throughout Echelon's products, too. So they have thousands of on-demand classes available with 30-plus accredited world-class trainers, and they have guests and celebrity instructors, too. So you can work out with the Echelon community and inspire each other, a little challenge, uh, you know, a little competition. You can climb the leaderboards. And Echelon has been featured all over. Women's Health, Cosmo, Time, People. Wall Street Journal says Echelon has cracked the code. Yahoo Finance says Echelon is where fitness and technology unite at a price you can afford. Ford. So if you want to turn things around and get in the best shape of your life, check out echelonfit.com today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. So this next segment is a little more personal. Um, it's not really like breaking news, but it includes part of an interview I conducted last year with former Secretary of the VA, David Shulkin. At the time, I was in the process of being removed from my job with the Department of Veterans Affairs that I had for over had had it for over a decade, but I couldn't release this part of the interview until the Mueller She Wrote podcast was over, and I no longer worked for the government because I didn't want to run afoul of any ethical concerns. So now that I'm no longer employed by the government, Mueller She Wrote has ended. I can openly talk about my, uh, the, you know, the super shady conditions of my removal, and I can share this interview with you. So for the first part of the interview, you can search, if you want to hear the, like, the beginning half of the interview, you can search for Mueller She Wrote with David Shulkin. I believe the episode came out in November of 2019. I think it was called The Mueller Memos. And uh, you can hear the first chunk of this interview. This is the second part. It was never been released before until now. My understanding is of those employees at VA, VHA, VBA, and the National Cemetery Administration, a, a good chunk of them are veterans themselves. And I've been doing this project for uh, two years, just about to the day. And I haven't told anybody this um, yet, but I am a VA employee. And your book has inspired me because when I read the title, it just resonated with me. I'm an 80% disabled veteran with PTS from military sexual trauma, as, as um, I said before. And like you, I left the private sector. Obama said, serve your country. And so I you know, raised my hand, too. And I took a GS-5 clerk job, uh, even though I had an MBA. But within seven years, I worked my way up to a GS-14. And I also earned a doctorate in health administration while there. I've been with VA for over 10 years. And in your book, you talk about... Department of Defense integration and how medical resource sharing across agencies was one of your priorities. And, and I was hoping you could explain why you made that a priority. I, I can't help but comment on what you just shared. Um, you know, I think that your story is amazing and your willingness and dedication to give back to your fellow uh, men and women that, that you served with, I think, is, is not only remarkable, but actually not that uncommon in the VA. And as you said, about 40% of VA employees are veterans and are there not because that's the only place they can work, but they're there, like you said, by choice to be able to give back. And so that's where my pride came from, 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 from being able to be in a position to help support and lead such incredible, dedicated people. And um, uh, probably the most uh, impressed fact that I can really reflect on my time there was having a chance to meet so many of our incredible veterans and employees who serve on a daily basis. But you asked a question about the Department of Defense and VA, and my feeling was that 
these organizations need to work closer together, that the VA knows where every future customer is going to come from, and that's the Department of Defense when they're discharged. And there were too many horror stories when uh, somebody left active military service before they got enrolled in the VA or because of the bureaucracy of getting enrolled in the VA. There was a gap in care, and during that period of time, some bad things can happen. In fact, we talk about the horror of veteran suicide. Well, the single highest period of veteran suicide is that one year after being discharged from the Department of Defense to uh, that first year of being back in the civilian world. So, so I felt very strongly that we needed to work much closer and there were much more similarities in problems and solutions with DOD and VA than people I think had recognized in the past. And I was very fortunate that Secretary Mattis, who was my colleague in the cabinet, uh, felt the same way. And Secretary Mattis had uh, told his staff, because they shared this with me, that um, if the Secretary of the VA asked for something, the answer should be yes, as if it's coming directly from Secretary Mattis. And that that gave us a great ability to work closer together, and we worked on issues like reducing veteran suicide. We combined our offices, actually, to be one, and we started to work much closer together on the Electronic Medical Record Project, and they shared their lessons, which really helped us at VA, and a whole number of ways that I think we can look forward to closer integration as these organizations develop. Well, when you, when you made that a priority, I felt especially valuable uh, in my job. I personally work in interagency health affairs in a medical sharing office responsible for that priority. And I worked on the Genesis Development Board for the electronic health record to integrate with DOD. And uh, it's a small office uh, of about 10 people. I'm one of only two liaisons to the Department of Defense in the country. We have one for each region, one for each TRICARE contract. And as you know, there's only two TRICARE offices. One is in Falls Church and one is in San Diego. And I'm, I'm the San Diego West Region uh, liaison to the Department of Defense for TRICARE. But at the height of our podcast, um, this past April, I was informed that my job was moving to D.C. as part of modernization. They said it was imperative I move or be fired because face-to-face -face interaction at central office was imperative. But I couldn't move um, because of family, so I had to decline. And because being fired exacerbated my PTSD, as I'm sure you can imagine, I filed a reasonable accommodation request to telework until I was removed from my job. But they denied my request ultimately, saying it was of the utmost importance I work face-to-face -face in the San Diego office, despite their argument my position is desperately needed in Washington, D.C. So I filed with EEO, and now I'm just basically fighting for my severance. And I don't know if I'm being pushed out for my political affiliations or as part of a larger effort to just modernize or cut government, but I'd like to ask you about Kushner's modernization efforts and what it means to have positions structurally eliminated, especially in light of Mick Mulvaney's recent comments about how hard it is to fire government employees so they get rid of them now by moving their positions across the country, as happened with the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture. And I was just wondering, during your time at VA, were you aware of anything like that, that sort of that modernization priority that was happening? I was not. Um, I did not actually interpret the word modernization and certainly the work that was being done out of the White House under Jared's um, leadership as um, a restructuring of the workforce. So so that's new news to me. I, I, the work that was being done was really a much more technologically focused approach towards modernization and innovation. Um, but, you know, it's certainly sad for me to hear that people who have the experience and who are as dedicated as you appear to be for the right reasons uh, are leaving the organization because that's really a brain drain. And um, what we need is, especially during these times where there's so much uh, so much concern about what's happening. We need continuity of people in these organizations, our career employees, to feel that they're secure and to be able to continue doing the work that they love doing. So, uh, I, I, I uh, you know, I think you're pursuing this with the uh, appropriate process that you have at your that 
you know, that you can pursue. Um, but it's uh, it's sad to hear the story. Um, another uh, sad event that um, just happened about a week ago, <clears throat> a scathing inspector general report came out indicating that the whistleblower office, accountability and whistleblower office, had run afoul of its intended mission by shielding Trump appointees from complainants and retaliating against employees who filed them through either demotion or structural structural elimination of their positions. And I was wondering if you saw that report and your thoughts on it, how, you know, just uh, like top line thoughts. I did. I did see the report. And um, I think that this was not the intent of the office as it was set up. And I think that this inspector general's report is probably going to be used by the VA to go back to the original intent of what the executive order had when it set up this office and go back to the intent of the original legislation that was passed and make sure that these types of things are no longer happening and that the office is there to support and build on the type of culture that VA needs to have in order to make the improvements that all of us wish for it. So um, I think that this is an important report and uh, it needs to be really studied internally to make sure that this type of environment gets reset to the original intent. I agree. I really hope it's a catalyst for for some action on that because you're right, that's not the original intent of, of that legislation. And and here, here's a weird question. Were you around? I don't, I don't remember when this happened, but there were some revised Hatch Act memos that came out uh, that explicitly forbid employees to speak negatively of Trump, um, especially on social media, instead of just what, you know, the normal Hatch Act, which is you can't oppose or support any political candidate. Do you remember that at all? I don't. I don't. Um, I bet you that must have happened after I left or or if it came out while I was still secretary, I was not aware of that. Of course, I was aware of the Hatch Act, but I never saw a memo that amended its meaning like that. Yeah. It, I, it, now that I think about it, I think it came out after you left. I think it came out in, uh, yeah, 2019, like early 2019. Um, and finally, I just thought that was weird, like, <laughs> like specifically putting his own name in there. But finally, in your book, you talk about how this administration could affect the future of government service. And, uh, you know, I personally, you know, I can't move or I would continue. I mean, I, you know, I, I dropped uh, quite a bit of money in student loans to get this public health administration doctorate. And this, this was going to be my career for my life. And uh, I I'm now can't finish that, but maybe I could come back later. And, you, you know, uh, along the lines of your uh, brain drain, how, how do you see, do you see people coming back maybe at a later date? Well, I just have to be optimistic that um, people are basically good and want to help people in need and that there's a essential role for government. And uh, our democracy has survived now 200 years and it's gone through its ups and downs. So I believe that we will rebound, but I believe that that needs to be a conscious effort. And our generation and the future generations simply can't accept what we have now, which is not working and dysfunctional and headed in the wrong direction. And so so I think that we have to be very deliberate about creating an environment that first puts uh, human dignity and respect for people as a primary value, start treating each other as if we care about each other and love each other, and then uh, refocus on what we're doing here. And our, our role in government is to help those who need our help and to protect our country. And I think the VA has such an incredible mission, a dignified mission, because it does both. It's an essential part of our national security. If, if people don't know that there's help should they need it, they're going to no longer be willing to volunteer and raise their hands to protect our country. And secondly, um, that that this is about uh, caring for those that need the help. And so uh, we need to remember why we were in this position in the first place and return to an environment that really helps support people do their jobs and serve people. 
Well, I'm definitely 100% with you on the optimism and the dedication to the oath and the mission of the VA. And I, I thank you so much for your service and your dedication to our veterans. And thanks for taking the time to speak with me today. Everyone, please, please check out Dr. Shulkin's book. It's called It Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Country. You can get it anywhere books are available. Uh, it's not only an important book um, about taking a, a look inside the VA and how it works, but what it's like to work uh, for the VA in over different administrations. Dr. Shulkin, thank you again for being on Mueller She Wrote today. Thank you so much. All right. That's my discussion with Dr. Shulkin. For more information about my case, you can search for me, Allison Gill, on the Whistleblower News Network blog. They've completely outlined my story there. Uh, I'm working on a book, searching for a publisher, uh, if you know any, uh, and a lot more will come out in the very near future. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with the good news. So stay with us. Hey, everybody, it's AJ for The Daily Beans. As a listener of the podcast, you already know about the pod pets, Bruce Willis and Boobs, my pod cats. I absolutely love them. They are my heroes, except for their litter box. It is a constant battle. It always smells. Everyone who has a cat knows about this. Um, That's why I now use Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter is reinvented cat litter. It's amazing. Unlike traditional litter, super light crystals trap odor, release moisture, and all of that results in a dry, low-maintenance litter that doesn't smell. And Pretty Litter is virtually dust-free because it's manufactured with specialized de-dusting processes. So there's less dust in the air in your home. And Pretty Litter arrives safely at my door in a small, lightweight bag that lasts up to a month. And now that I get litter bags auto-shipped, I don't have to go to the store, which is safer for for everybody in the house, which is really just me and the cats. And shipping is free. But above all else, here's why Pretty Litter is a pet parent's hero. It's a health indicator. It's like mood litter. It monitors my cat's health by changing colors when it detects potential underlying health issues. You will not find that innovation in any other litter. So now the podcast to the pod pets, Bruce and, and uh, boobs, they have their mood litter. Everything's great. There's no dust. There's no mess. There's no smell. So get the world's smartest litter without leaving home by visiting prettylitter.com. Use promo code daily beans for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com and promo code daily beans for 20% off your first order. Again, prettylitter.com promo code daily beans. You'll be glad you did. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the, oh, I'm already reading ahead, Dana, and I'm going to leave. I know. <laughs> Leave the first one for you. Take it's very short, but take the first one and and the second one, please, if if you would. You got it, sweetheart. You got it. Okay. This one comes from Tina, which I love because we talked about Tina yesterday. Uh, Tina pronoun she and her. I just wanted to get the correct picture to you for my confession. I promise the puppy is in fact a puppy, and I'm sorry to say I don't have a pineapple. So if you listen to yesterday's episode, we were very confused that Tina had sent in a story about a dog, and there was a very large cat on a couch and so now we have the correct puppy pictures which are absolutely adorable and two puppies one of them looking at me like why the fuck are you questioning my mother (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and the room with the cat had a lava lamp and a pineapple and a gargoyle and a guitar it was a wonder i'm now i'm fascinated as to whose living room that is oh we're gonna find out we are gonna find out in this episode of the good news (laughs) <laughs> I, I promise you we are because I did need oh. a little bit a little Ooh, bit so we're gonna farther yes. ahead than me and the reason Tina we I was honestly convinced that was your living room because you just said that you date women so you are either bi or in the lesbian persuasion and so it didn't shock me that there was a lava lamp a pineapple and a guitar in your living room <laughs> Okay, so if that's a straight person's living room, what you're about to find out. <clears throat> All right, more questions. Another news story, though. This one's coming from Holly, pronouns she and her. Hi, Beans team. This is a quarantine confession. I have become, let's say, a little fuller in the body since quarantine. You and me both, sister. That was just my interjection. <laughs> I've been working from home since March. Who knew that more calories and less exercise would lead to weight gain? This what? weekend, I felt like being fancy. I know. This weekend, I felt like being fancy and tried to put on a real bra for the first time in months. Oh, I found God. that none I've done of that. them fit at all. And it's the least comfortable thing ever. It's awful. So like trying to stuff grapefruits into a Dixie cup. <laughs> exactly. The confession is I've been having chest and back pain for a while now, and I thought I just needed more support. So I've been wearing my sports bras, even to bed, for weeks without realizing they are also way too small. I've been crushing my own boobs like the frog in a boiling water. I did not notice over the course of time how much I had outgrown them. 
I had a big aha moment when I saw just how much I didn't fit into my old bras. I blame the stretchiness of the sports bras for making it so easy to keep squishing everything in there. <laughs> now, I'm recuperating, letting everything hang loose and heal, and wondering if I'm the only one out of hubris and a lack of self-awareness has been cramming myself into clothes that don't fit to the point of minor injury. <laughs> Attached is a picture of my pod cat Luxy, my 17-year-old curvaceous calico who has been with me all her life, looking regal and disdainful because she's old and has earned the right to look down on everyone. Love you all. And I want to introduce you to the picture <laughs> of the cat with the pineapple, the lava lamp, and the guitar. <laughs> Uh, there's where it goes <laughs> yes this is holly's place and holly oh, i apologize holly. if you are not a lesbian there's no inference it's just there if 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 there's someone showed me a picture and it was like a highlights magazine and they said circle the objects that might belong in a lesbian's apartment <laughs> i would circle the guitar and the cat what about the sequin purple pillow i don't want to talk about that that okay. actually looks like she might have borrowed it from a gay man <laughs> this belongs to the cat i have a feeling i love those pillows actually holly because you can like you when you stroke them one way god this is gonna yeah. sound dirty when you stroke them one way they look they do one thing and when you stroke them the other way they, there's a different pattern can we move on aj read the next yep, goddamn yep, we're gonna go ahead and, submission we're gonna go ahead and move on. but thank you luxie and hey if anybody has stories about being the frog in the boiling sports bra uh and not noticing the boiling uh, bra <laughs> let us know um i'm i'm interested in that too like have you not noticed your clothes getting smaller because of the stretchiness of the fat you know the the athleisure wear and uh which i only wear now i you know i put on a bra it fits but like like a real fancy bra like a one with the underwire and the you know lace and stuff and it yeah. sucked i was like that ah, fuck this um Anyway, next up from Sue, pronoun she and her. Thank you, thank you for keeping me sane through this 2020 shit show. Your pods have gone a long way towards calming my anxiety over Cittolini's attempt to destroy our democracy. My wonderful mother-in-law, Joy, has also been listening faithfully for a month or so. Hi, Joy. And she is grateful that I recommended your pod to her. My good news is I recently sold my insurance agency. Oh, nice. And I've started a new venture as an epoxy artist. Hell yes. Ooh. Out of insurance into art. The plan is slowly coming together. My stress levels have dropped like a rock since I made this leap. My family has been uber supportive. I'm truly blessed. For the pet tax, I submit two of my beautiful babies who happen to be named Gritty and Kraken. <laughs> oh, my God. As you can tell from their faces, they would like everyone to stop talking about them right meow. I also have a very sweet girl named Dodo, but she's hiding under the bed until all this craziness is over. Uh, I've also attached a pic of my beautiful three-year-old grandbaby, Addison. She and Gritty are BFFs. I think it's so great oh, that yes, the cats are, are named Gritty and Kraken prior to Gritty and Kraken. Um, yeah. That's amazing. That's very prescient. It is also amazing how a cat in one look can really just tell you to go fuck yourself. Mm, that's what's <laughs> happening here. <laughs> they, should, they really are like, stop looking at me, but look at that grandbaby. Look at that I know. dimple. Oh, the cleft the chin, chin dimple. is so cute. Oh, I'm, po I'm poking it with my cursor. This is so Do cute. It. Oh, it's so, so cute. Thank you for sending in these pod pads, cats, and your granddaughter. She's adorable. Addison, I love that name, too. Mm. Ah, we've got more good news. This is coming from Mike from Ohio, pronouns he and him. I wrote a few months back about leaving snacks and drinks on my porch for delivery drivers. The story's about those very snacks. Please don't look at the photos until after reading. Mike, I promise you, I have not. I have not. I don't know if she did. Don't scroll, AG. <laughs> I won't. I haven't looked okay. yet. All right. One night about a month ago... When I went out to bring in the tray of chips for the night, it had been flipped over. I figured it was the wind, but I was wrong. Two weeks ago, I approached the front door and looked out to see the exact same scene with the addition of this little guy chowing down on some barbecue Lay's potato <laughs> chips. I can only assume this isn't a human at this point, but I have not looked ahead. <laughs> a few days later, he visited again, but we witnessed only the aftermath. That day, he was hungry for Fritos and garden salsa sun chips. <laughs> Finally, just two days ago, my wife caught a little one before the act of mischief. We keep a box on the porch for our cats to chill. She happened to be at the front door. Watch this little guy waddle up the steps. Again, I'm assuming this is not a human. She opened the door and said, excuse me, 
As the possum screamed at her and ran into the <laughs> box, she was able to capture this photo. I think it belongs in a museum. Now my wife brings in the chips as soon as it gets dark out. Additional photo of the cat in said box included. If you want to know about a possum scream, <laughs> if you want to know what a possum scream sounds like, she says it's exactly like this video. I'm assuming AG will include a link to that. Let's uh, let's actually let's actually hear it. Oh can my god, you have it. it. Okay. Let's let's see if Matt can play it. Oh my god. I feel like that, I would be that's that is okay. That would be terrifying if you did not know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By the way, I looked up a possum versus possum. Okay. So thank you for the correction already. Cause I was going to get one from a person. I'm sure. By the way, I looked up opossum versus possum and they're different animals. In North America, we have opossums, which please um, let me just tell you is what I've been talking about the entire time. Not a possum, not Jesus, not possum. I've been talking about opossum. <laughs> The entire submission. In North America, we have opossums, but it's okay if you don't pronounce the first O. P great. Okay, so apparently it doesn't matter. Possums are native to Australia, and both are marsupials. I just learned this, so I thought I would share. Hope this brightens your day. Good for good measure. Here's a photo of both our cats chilling in the bed. Look at this little one full <laughs> chubby of chips. <laughs> And you match that with the scream. Uh, oh, and then there's there's cats in the box. Um, I feel like the cat in the box just heard an opossum scream. <laughs> yeah, that look the, on the face. Yeah. What? Oh. And then there's one on. They're sleeping on the bed, and one of them is curled up like a shrimp. Oh, that's adorable. Oh my god, so cute. Oh, next up from Joshua. Hi everyone. I hope your corn giving was safe and wholesome. I wanted to give a personal update for the good news segment. I just had my first follow up CT scans post surgery, and while there is a small complication with fluid buildup, there is no cancer visibly present in my upper, upper lymph nodes. Wonderful. So the surgery was a success. While the chances of reemergence are not 0%, it's very low, so I'll be watching it for a few years. But overall, I'm back at work cancer-free. Thanks to all the support from you three, AG, Mandy, and Jordan, and the Daily Beans family who donated, spread the word, and reached out with positive vibes and kind words. Also, Trump's not president anymore, so everything's good right now. Thanks so much to everyone. Josh, that's wonderful, wonderful news. That is. Joshua, thank you. I'm so happy to hear. All right, we have another one. Oh, I love how many stories we have today. This is from Anonymous, pronouns he and him. Hello, my dear Leguminati. I just stumbled across the best idea I have seen in a very long time, and I had to, had to, like a gunpoint and stuff, share this with you, courtesy of a random tweet and an eight-year-old with the best attitude in the universe. There's a picture uh, later on. Apparently, this eight-year-old carries emergency confetti, oh my God, for whenever there is unexpected good news. After this ass-over tea kettle dumpster fire inside a three-ring shit show of a year, I think we all need the celebrations of good news when we can get. And the first thing Friday morning, I'm marching my happy ass down to the craft store and I'm buying as much biodegradable confetti as I can lay in my grubby mitts on. Why, mm. you may ask, for emergency confetti kits for every damn person I know. We need mm. all of this right now and I am determined to make this wholesomeness happen. As pod pet tax, I include a screenshot of the recent Zoom meeting where my Maxlet, which is the name, my Maxlet was trying to help... Oh, help daddy work by randomly jumping on my lap. Unfortunately, this behavior encouraged others to include their fur babies in the meeting. And I have high hopes this becomes a regular thing going forward. Many hugs. I hope you're all well and safe and hopeful. I know I am. And we all know that hope is a revolutionary act. Thank you so much for all you do. I saw this tweet. The tweet is from um, oh, I Anna. Oh, I too. The distracted gardener. My eight-year-old in the car today. Do you want me to throw confetti in my pocket? No, not in the car. Do you, Why do you have confetti in your pocket? And the eight-year-old says, it's my emergency confetti. I carry it everywhere in case there's good news. <laughs> I loved this so much. I retweeted it. Um, I have, I carry around emergency googly eyes. Oh, those are the best. Um, you can actually get them on Amazon. The thing says it's a tin. It's like a little tin full of emergency googly eyes. So you can just put googly eyes on stuff whenever you, whenever the need arises. It does. It happens quite a bit. You'd be surprised how often, you know, you need to use the emergency googly eyes. But I do love the emergency confetti. And thank you for sending this picture. Look. 
Oh, they're both so handsome. <laughs> I know that is a good beard. Is that a chicken on the fridge in the background? It is. We we've turned into room raiders, which I think is the hysterical thing. We're like, there's a chicken on the fridge. <laughs> yeah, I had. I I have a thing for chickens, and when. Uh, I used to have this little chicken head magnet that I would stick on the fridge and my cat would jump up and try to eat it. And then at the, around that time, there was an Aerosmith song that came out. It was like 1999 and the song was Living on the Edge. It was Living on the Edge. And yeah. I, of course, turned that into Chicken on the Fridge. Nice. And now it looks like Anonymous has one as well. That's amazing. Who would have thought? Good beard, too. Good beard. Mm -hmm. Good cute dog, too. Good beard and cute Look dog. The dog. And he's furrowing his brow just like Susan Collins. He's doing his best Susan Collins. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for your good news submissions and confessions and corrections. That the that first couple of things where we got the pictures right, that was wonderful. And uh, I really uh, appreciate you sending them. And you can send them in. You just head to, uh, what is it, dailybeanspod.com and click contact. And that's where you can send your good news, whether it's personal or news related or you know you can do confessions or corrections or just say hi or just send us photos of your family or your favorite things or your, your pod pets we love them we love them all um so we i i, I seriously these get me through the week i appreciate it 100 percent with my whole entire heart um do you have anything you want to add before we get out of here dana no, we're in the first day of December, everyone. So we've got one month left in this year. Thank God 2020, 2020 will be over in 31 days. Oh, and if you're listening to this and you got through days. the first, I know, 50 days until Trump is gone. Yes, and everyone else. Oh, oh my gosh, I know. And then you know what? 51 days until those kids don't have Secret Service coverage anymore. And I'm not saying anything bad. I'm just happy I don't have to pay for it anymore. Do the kids lose their Secret Service? Is it just the president? From what I understand, yep, that there was a correction because I was wondering about this. Any kid over 18 mm. in the family oh, right. apparently loses their Secret Service uh, detail after um, they leave the office. If I'm wrong, someone, yeah, if I'm wrong, someone correct me. But that, I think that was actually someone correcting me <laughs> on the podcast. Uh, I... That's right. That's right. And I re and I've also uh, heard that you know, Vonky and Kushner are not going to be able to return to their you know dilettante, uh, fan fabulous New York society lives, and and everyone's just really pleased about that. That's wonderful. <laughs> There's some good news for you. Yep. You're not welcome here anymore. You're gonna have to try Florida. Seriously, maybe, maybe that one place in the villages or something. Let me go live there. Enjoy it. Uh, all right, everybody, until tomorrow, uh, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, take care of the planet, and take care of your mental health. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is executive produced and directed by AG and Jordan Coburn, and engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Industries. Our marketing manager, executive assistant, production and social media direction is Amanda Reeder. Fact-checking and research by AG, Jordan Coburn, and Amanda Reeder. Our music is written and performed by They Might Be Giants. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our website is dailybeanspod.com. <laughs>